Good afternoon, everyone, I'm, and welcome to the 50th at Noon Lecture Series. Ugh, I'm an emotional guy. Um, I'm John Kilborn, Professor of Movement Science and a faculty member on the 50th Anniversary Steering Committee. Working closely with Terry Lucy and Robbie Asipoff from the President's Office, we have created the 50th at Noon Lecture Series, similar to Arts at Noon. Our goal was to provide a forum for students, faculty, and staff to learn about the wonderful history of Grand Valley State University. Over the course of this academic year, there will be four presentations, two in the fall term and two in the winter term. Our kickoff presentation today features two of the people whose vision and perseverance helped make Grand Valley State University what it is today, Provost Emeritus Dr. Glenn Niemeyer and President Emeritus Don Lovers. To help build a bridge from the past to the present, I would like to introduce our current provost, Dr. Gail Davis, to introduce Dr. Niemeyer. I am so honored and happy to be here with you today for this event. It is an honor, definitely, to be able to begin the 50th anniversary series, but it's absolutely stupendous to be able to introduce Provost Emeritus Niemeyer. Welcome. Really nice to have you on stage. And Betty Niemeyer is here today, too. Welcome to you, Betty. It's great to see you. Provost Niemeyer's service at the university spanned a very long time. He was a U.S. history professor as one of our 14, I guess it was, pioneer faculty members, and he moved up through various ranks, including dean, vice president for the colleges, vice president for academic affairs, and his last promotion to provost started in 1980 and uh, he served in that role until 2001. So this is a man who knows Grand Valley. It is a special honor to be here with him and with President Emeritus Lovers to say, let's hear about Grand Valley's development. It'll be a great session this noon. But before I call, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Before I call Provost Niemeyer to this stage, I'd like to tell you a few things that I know he won't say. Like that he has been a respected and beloved colleague for countless people at Grand Valley over the years. And that he brought extraordinary intelligence, stature, and strength to his roles here, guiding the academic side of the university and helping to establish this wonderful place and put it on the map or like that he has been the perfect counsel for me ever since I came to Grand Valley in 2002, giving me insights and information when I asked for it and expressing support for the various initiatives my office has undertaken. I really appreciate that support, Glenn. He's honored in many ways on our campus already. There's the Niemeyer Living and Learning Center where a handsome portrait and a bust of him are displayed. There's the prestigious Niemeyer Awards for faculty and student excellence that he almost always helps me announce at our annual awards banquet. But maybe the strongest symbol of how much he's appreciated at Grand Valley is that we still want to hear his perspectives and his stories. We still want him connected to Grand Valley in every way possible. And we are excited to have you here this noon and looking forward to your remarks. Please join me. Or are you <laughs> Gail, thank you for that uh, very kind and generous introduction. I um, also want to thank uh, John Kilborn John has been so attentive to everything relative to our appearance here today, and also the other two members of that committee, Terry and Robbie as well. So thanks for putting this on, and thanks for the invitation to speak today. Uh, for my presentation, I thought I would talk about the early years at Grand Valley. Um, in particular, I thought I would 
concentrate on three particular periods. Uh, the first is just getting started, the uh, summer and fall of 1963, what that was like. Secondly, the problems that surfaced during the 1970s, which then led to the reorganization of the late 70s and early 80s. My first acquaintance with Grand Valley occurred in February of 1963. I had been invited to campus for an interview, and I didn't know very much about Grand Valley at the time. I had just read a couple of newspaper articles that they were forming a state institution, the western part of the state, over by Allendale, and uh, that they were uh, beginning the construction of a couple of buildings. So I was invited for an interview and came over and was directed to what everybody knows about by now, and that's the Gray House. Uh, the Gray House was one of two that were on the property right on M50. Uh, it's, it's M45 now. Well, anyway, it was M50 at the time. And uh, so uh, I drove over. I knew approximately where it was and drove over and went in the house, and I was ushered to the second floor where the administrative offices were located. And there I met with George Potter, who I think had the title at the time, uh, Assistant to the President. And we had an interview for about an hour. And at the end of that, uh, George went into some detail about all of the ideas and concepts that were going into the formation of this new institution. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. But in the meantime, we then went next door to the Pink House. And there I met Steve Ford, who was beginning the, to assemble a library in the two-stall garage. After uh, I received an offer and accepted I was then invited to send a list of books that I thought ought to be included in the library. And I heard later, you never hear about these things immediately, but I heard later, because I sent in a list of a thousand books, which I thought was modest, but they were sort of overwhelmed. Well, it was Steve Ford and a couple other people working there with a list for a thousand books. Anyway, I said I'd come back to the ideas and the concepts behind the formation of Grand Valley, and there were several. One was that it would be a cluster of colleges, in other words, several colleges existing on the same campus, an idea which was apparently taken from some experience at Oxford, that uh, Grand Valley would have several colleges on the same campus, and the emphasis were on two factors. One was smallness, that while you could have many students on the campus, you'd be essentially part of a much smaller academic community. And they had talked about colleges of about 3,000 and perhaps four uh, different colleges for a total of 12,000 students at some point. The other was that there was to be similarity. Although the curriculum might not be identical, nevertheless it would be very similar. And the thought was that students could, would be enrolled in a given college and take their major there and receive their degree from that college, but they would be able to take courses in any one of the colleges that existed on the campus. Furthermore, that faculty would be assigned to one college, but similarly would be able to teach courses in any one of the colleges. Also, they told me about the plans for buildings on the campus, and there were to be buildings that would accommodate the clusters. And uh, during the time that the cluster college was in existence, two clusters were in fact built. One was Lake Michigan Hall, Lake Superior Hall, and Lake Huron Hall, and then decided to move to the north side of campus and built Manitou and Mackinac Hall. The curriculum was founded on the liberal arts, and that was strongly emphasized. Um, in fact, uh, students would only be able to major in the liberal arts. There were to be no professional programs offered. But during the summer of 1963, uh, the applications and registrations for enrollment lagged considerably behind the expectations. And at the last minute, they belatedly had a teacher certification to the offerings of the institution. There were nine courses offered in that first year, uh, and the institution was on a term or a quarter schedule. So a student was expected to take three courses each of the uh, terms, or fall, winter, spring. And each of the courses carried five hours of credit, which was something that had been brought over from Dartmouth. The, uh, the nine courses were essentially the general education program 
for the institution at the time. As I said, the course has carried five hours of credit, three hours of lecture, one hour of discussion, and one hour of tutorials. And in fact, uh, looking back on it, it was a fairly rigorous program of study for students. There were also uh, what I think is equivalent to a great books program where all of the students that were enrolled had to purchase five books, which they were expected to read during the summer. And in addition to that, they had to purchase a copy of what was called the Practical Stylist, which was really a manual for writing scholarly papers. How do you footnote and how do you put down a bibliography and the like? I think it's fair to say that the, the expectations of faculty were really quite high. And the difficulty was that some of the students were not fully prepared for the rigors of that program, and so you had some mismatch. And as a result, the retention rate was really quite high. As fall approached in the summer of 1963, it was clear that the buildings wouldn't be finished on time. And so the question then was, where were we going to meet? And there was some talk about uh, beginning classes at a school building in Hudsonville. And I think, fortunately, decided not to do that, and all of us would pile into Lake Michigan Hall um, so that the classes would be going on at the same time that the work was going on, and there would be some conflict between what was going on in class and what was going on elsewhere. The first faculty meeting was held at the Allendale Township Hall, which was sort of a new experience among many others. Um, and then hurriedly, they moved us all into our offices. But when I say they moved us into our offices, the way they moved us into our offices was they brought around these big plastic carts. And all of us would put our books and everything else in the bin, and you'd get a colleague to help you tip the, your desk upside down, put it on top, and then you'd roll that to wherever your office was located. And I think in the first few years, I, I, eventually I gave up counting, but I do remember that one time in the first few years I had moved 11 times, so we made a lot of use of those plastic carts. The convocation was held that first year, all of us looking very sober in our academic regalia, in the upper floor, the second floor of Lake Michigan Hall on the east side. At that time that was all open to accommodate gatherings such as that, and of course now it's all been converted into offices. Moving ahead somewhat quickly now, the first commencement was held in June of 1967, and the speaker was Harlan Hatcher, who was the president at the time of the University of Michigan, and then I suppose to appear to be uh, even-handed. In 1968, the speaker was John Hanna from the Michigan State University. The, um, the search committee was formed in 1968 when when President Zumberg decided to leave, and Bill Seidman decided he was going to chair that committee as well. And I was fortunate to be a faculty rep on that committee, and I recall at one time that Bill Seidman said he was going to go to Wisconsin and Iowa because there were a couple of people he had heard were good presidents, and he wanted to interview them. He came back, and he raved about this person from uh, Central College in Iowa. Um, I was a little unsure because he came from the Reform College, but that's an inside thing. In any case, uh, and I do recall that Don came to campus for an interview, and being on the committee that I did have the opportunity to interview him for the position as well. Fortunately, he uh, accepted the position and came to Grand Valley in 1969. I want to leave that at this point and move now to the second thing that I said I was going to talk about, and that's what I've labeled developing difficulties. To some extent, the difficulties were inherent in some of the concepts on which the college was founded. First of all, one of the serious problems was, was I think, limited enrollment, that we never did manage to uh, beat the expectations as far as enrollment was concerned. And that, I think, was largely due to the limitations of curriculum. As I said earlier, it was confined to the liberal arts. And that was wonderful to have that as the foundation for the curriculum. But to limit the majors to only the liberal arts was, I think, too, far too restrictive. There were times when um, there was rumors which seemed to go on uh, somewhat constantly that Grand Valley was going to be turned into a prison. 
those of us who occupied the building thought that was somewhat uh, impractical, uh, that these buildings could become, you know, prisons. But in any case, it was, it had an unsettling and effect upon those of us who were here at the time. Uh, to, you know, when you're trying to run a college and continually people are talking about turning it into a prison, was, uh, was that. Also, there were some of us who were really concerned about the enrollment picture. And I can recall that some of us got together, we were all liberal arts faculty, but we got together to form a committee, which was, we called the Committee on New Academic Programs. And the whole purpose was that we were going to come up with new programs that we were going to advise the, the administration they ought to start. Uh, we had one serious problem, I thought, and that was that we had never been recognized by the administration. We had just started the committee on our own. And at one of our meetings, it was thought that probably it'd be a good idea if we would inform President Zumberg that we existed. And that, I thought, was a good idea, but the follow-up was not nearly as good that they appointed me as the one to tell them. Well, I called and uh, made an appointment to see him. I had talked to him on a couple previous occasions, and I should point out that I was, a, I was probably the youngest faculty member at the time, and it seemed a little brash that strictly on the basis of age, I'm the one go, going to see him. Uh, I, uh, I wasn't sure what kind of a reaction I would get, but I must say that he was very good about it, very even-handed, uh, listened politely to everything I had to say, didn't make any comment, and certainly didn't make any commitments, but at least I got out of there feeling like I had saved myself. Uh, so the whole question about enrollment was a very serious problem from the outset. A second problem was in terms of the relationship between the colleges. To say that there was hostility is not an overstatement. People in the various colleges just plain out could not stand each other. And if they couldn't stand each other, they certainly weren't going to accept the credit. And so the fact of the matter was, it was much easier to transfer credit from an external institution than it was to transfer credit internal. I mean, that sounds ludicrous, but that's exactly what happened. And then the whole idea about faculty teaching in the other colleges. I remember I was in the history department at the time, and we had a couple suggestions that someone ought to teach some of the history courses. We looked at each other and said, there's no way. There's just no way. They don't know anything about history. There's no way they're going to teach. Thirdly, there was the problem of, I think, the failure of the public to understand what was really going on. It was an age of innovation in higher education, and Grand Valley was simply one across the country that was one of these innovative new, new kind of colleges. But that didn't sit well in western Michigan. They didn't understand what we were all about, how we were organized, how we had more than one college on a campus, all of that, and not understanding refused to accept. And finally, there was what I'll call repeated criticism from the media, and especially the Grand Rapids Press, and since that was so long ago, you're able to say it, because I remember Bill Seidman always advising us, never pick a fight with somebody who buys ink by the barrel. And they were buying more ink than we were, uh, so we were somewhat careful. But there was a time when one of the sports writers, which I thought was ironic, one of the sports writers wrote six articles about Grand Valley, which appeared in six successive Sunday press. And each one of them increasingly more critical of Grand Valley, and I guess that was even too much for us. So what we decided to do was to invite uh, the editor and city editor to come to campus so that we could talk about it, that we would let them know how we felt about what they were doing, and they would similarly have the right to tell us how they felt about Grand Valley. Well, uh, I was one who took that probably too seriously, and so I thought I ought to let them know how I did feel about it. About an hour after the meeting was over, I got a call from Mike Lloyd saying, I think you and I need to talk. And he said, would you be willing to come down to the press? And I said I would. And so he and I met for a couple of times, and I think we somewhat resolved the differences that we had. Well, that was the situation which got progressively worse as the 70s went along, and that really led to the reorganization, which, which was initiated by the budget cuts that we had. The first of those cuts came in 1978, and I don't remember what the cut was for the entire institution, 
but it's firmly implanted in my memory of what it was for the Academic and Student Affairs Division, it was $700,000, which at that time seemed like a ton of money. What I decided to do was to convene the Dean's Council a couple of nights. We met in the Zumberg boardroom, but we pulled the drapes because we wanted to have as much privacy as possible as we talked about who's going to get cut. And the issue was really, were we going to cut somewhat across the board so that all of the units absorb, absorb some part of the reduction, or were we going to cut deeply in one or at best a few units? We talked about that at length, and finally, with all the budget papers in front of us, we finally decided that it would be better if we would cut deeply. The unit that was most vulnerable was Thomas Jefferson College, which had been losing enrollment. And the question about its continued viability was a real one. It also, coincidentally, was the fact that their budget was almost equal to the cut that we had to make. And so we made that recommendation. <laughs> was co coincidental, but was also convenient. <laughs> so we decided that we would make that recommendation, made that recommendation to President Lovers. And one afternoon, I think it was in the fall, he and I stoutly marched from Zumberg Library over to Lake Huron Hall, where we met with the faculty and students from, uh, from Thomas Jefferson College. Uh, to say that it was a somewhat strained atmosphere would not be an overstatement. Um, it was just downright grim. And um, they voiced their thoughts to us, and we to them. And uh, as I think back on it, though, while it was pretty intense, it was always civil, that we did, you know, address each other properly, and uh, thereafter we went about uh, the closing of Thomas Jefferson College. That lasted for a couple of years until we got a second cut, I think it was in 1980, which was a heavier, or a more expensive cut than the one we had absorbed earlier. And the question was now, how are we going to handle that? And what we did uh, made the recommendation that what we should do is collapse or abolish the cluster college system and instead reorganize into divisions. The Arts and Humanities Division, the Social Science Division, Science and Math Division, and the Seidman School of Business. We uh, presented that to the board at a meeting in uh, the lower level of Kirkhoff Center. And I can recall the board and the administration was seated at the north end and I can remember looking down the halls, and as far as I could see, nothing but faces. I tell you, to think about interest in that topic on the campus. It captured everybody's attention. Well, the faculty and um, the administration sort of presented their cases at that meeting. And at the conclusion of it, the board decided to call a special meeting, sort of a hearing, at which both sides could present the arguments for reorganization and against it. And they also asked that two board members preside at that particular meeting. That was held a couple weeks later in the second floor of Kirkhoff. And I remember that the, the argument against reorganization was largely carried on by the faculty from William James. Again, everybody was very serious about all of this. And the, uh, the meeting went on for most of the day. That was followed by uh, a meeting of the faculty senate again in the lower level of Kirkhoff. And we thought that, well, we didn't know how long the meeting was going to last, and so we thought probably we ought to have food brought in. Well, we convened and we met for a couple hours from 3 until 5, and then we decided that it was time to eat. And as we sat down to eat, someone wryly commented that it felt a lot like the Last Supper. Well, after we finished eating, uh, we resumed meeting once again, and uh, a female faculty member rose to address the group. Uh, this particular person had spoken against the reorganization on a couple previous occasions. I was largely familiar with what she was going to say. But in any case, she rose again, and as she began to speak, it was increasingly clear that she was very agitated, very upset, and really bordering on distraught. As she came to conclude her remarks, uh, she began and said, if you do that, if you do that, if you do that, she says, you're going you're gonna to castrate a dean. Well, I had never heard a comment like that made in a faculty senate meeting before. <laughs> and I wasn't sure exactly what she meant by that, but I thought I had some idea. 
And so my mind was now racing as to what was the appropriate thing to do or to say. And nothing came immediately to mind. And so finally what came out was, well, we certainly wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> In any case, uh, that pretty much concluded the conversation from that point on, and it became clear that what we ought to do is to adjourn, so that's what we did. <laughs> A couple of weeks later, uh, the board met again. Again, once again, the issue before the board was the reorganization, and the board accepted that. There were those who predicted that the reorganization would never work, that the faculty would never come together. There would be such animosity that would continue. They would not agree to be colleagues in the same departments and so forth. But that did not come true at all. In fact, it came together very smoothly. The faculty merged. They began to uh, respect their colleagues. And the whole atmosphere on campus changed very quickly. After reorganization, I think it's fair to say that the institution flourished in almost every respect. Enrollment in steadily increased. The academic reputation improved. New academic programs, particularly professional, were added year after year. New buildings were built almost without interruption. And new campuses were built in Grand Rapids, Holland, Muskegon, and Traverse City. In many respects, I think, the reorganization signaled the end of one era and the beginning of another. And in conclusion, that's the way it was at Grand Valley in those early years where the faculty were accomplished, the students hardworking, staff and administration conscientious, and where I think everyone was dedicated to making the institution as good as it could be. Thanks.